Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, welcome to the second in our series of three webinars organized by Euroace and looking at the <coughs> revisions to come for the Energy Performance of Buildings Directive. I'm actually delighted that today we're going to discuss the question of, I suppose, information tools with a focus on energy performance certificates. We will also hear about building renovation passports and digital building logbooks. We have a very uh, rich uh, set of uh, slides and presentations for you uh, that will be circulated after the event. And indeed, the recording of the event will be um, shared on our website. So I'm not going to delay too long in saying that uh, you're more than welcome, but you're kindly asked to remain muted during the session with no cameras on for the entire duration of the webinar. As you can see, only speakers and I as the moderator will remain unmuted. There are going to be two uh, question and answer sessions uh, following each of our two panels. And ahead of those sessions, you're invited to write your questions into the chat box. And in the chat box, I will monitor the questions, group them, and ask them to the speakers. Indeed, the question should be as concise and precise as possible, uh, stating which speaker you'd like to address it to. And um, as I just said, all of the presentations will be shared with you uh, later. Euroace, as you know, I hope, is the European Alliance of Companies for Energy Efficiency in Buildings. We've been around for more than 20 years. Um, we have accompanied every stage of the development of the Energy Performance uh, in Buildings Directive. And uh, we work to uh, achieve a more coherent, ambitious framework for buildings, both new and existing at European level, that are then implemented at member state level. Our members, you see their logos here, uh, directly employ more than 220,000 uh, at more than 1,100 production facilities and offices across the EU. And what sets us apart is that we have a cross-sector representativeness uh, covering all the equipment, uh, materials, products and services that go together to create highly energy performing and energy efficient uh, buildings. We do this because we believe energy efficiency in buildings is the most cost-effective way of creating employment and securing economic growth, alleviating energy poverty in the long term, providing people with comfortable and healthy homes, meeting carbon reduction and climate targets, and indeed achieving energy security. And one of our flagship actions is the Renovate Europe campaign, which now has 48 partners, uh, including 18 at national level. The Renovate Europe campaign works to significantly increase the ambition, uh, both in rate and depth of renovations across Europe, to achieve a highly energy efficient and decarbonized building stock by 2050, by reducing energy demand by 80% by the same date. So turning quickly to today's agenda, as I said, the Energy Performance Certificate is really a market-based and information tool. And as such, it must be uh, readable and usable and useful for consumers. And I'm delighted that we will start with a presentation from Burke, the European Consumers Association. Then we're going to see uh, two presentations from two EU-funded projects on next generation uh, energy performance certificates to learn about the thinking moving forward about what could become a, a more powerful tool. Then we'll have our first uh, question and answer session, followed by the second panel, where we will look more closely at other information tools uh, with the building renovation passport and the digital building logbook being presented. And then we'll have a wrap up question and answer session with all panelists, and I'll draw some conclusions towards the end. So, without further ado, it's my real pleasure to uh, introduce Guillaume Jolie. Uh, Guillaume, I hope you're with us. I haven't checked. 
Um, and Guillaume, uh, if you just say next slide, I will move the slides forward as you make your presentation. So the floor is now yours, Guillaume. You may turn on your camera if you wish, or you may leave it off. Guillaume. Uh, thanks, Adrian, and hi, everyone. Uh, as I uh, mentioned, I'm Guillaume Jolie, the Sustainable uh, Housing Officer at Berg, the European Consumer Organization. And we can get on to the, the next slide, please. So, oh, next, please. So, Berg is the European Consumer Organization. Its members are national consumer organizations, which, which is quite valuable. We're getting feedback from the, from the ground and field. Uh, the the work stream on energy is not new at Berk, but a holistic approach on the residential retrofit um, and energy efficiency is uh, uh, building on. Also including and overlapping the decarbonization of heating and cooling. So we take uh, the uh, opportunity to surf the renovation wave to uh, reinforce the consumer's protection. And we, we are working on the fit for 55 strategy. Uh, also related to the, um, uh, the revision of uh, the energy efficiency directives and energy performance of building directives. So here I, I just will um, give the main outtake regarding the EPCs as we see it at Berk. EPCs should be designed as a marketing tool, uh, meaning like information and not too expensive tool. Fit in a from A to Z, 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 Z sorry, uh, advice and support service to consumers. And I will uh, roll out what it means. Next, please. <clears throat> so, general observation from our members uh, as identified in the directive, the consumers, the most in need of information on energy performance and its cost, are prospective buyers and prospective tenants. The implementation, though, at the national level is quite diverse regarding cost, accreditation and skills of the assessors and adaptation to consumer's profile. If EPCs have been of some use, the general observation from our members is that, is that their reliability needs to be improved. Next, please. So feedback from our UK member citizens advice. Uh, a study highlights that inconsistencies of EPCs can vary uh, significantly. A research on past schemes found that different assessors gave, a, gave the same property a significantly different EPC rating. And it's consistent with all our members. This undermines their key purposes to help consumers to understand and make decisions to improve the performance of their homes because if they contrast it, they won't uh, implement it. It also creates uh, knock-on problems for policies that use EPCs. So it's not only uh, detrimental for consumers, but also for local authorities who don't have a real tool to rely on uh, regarding um, the ratings, for example, for uh, qualifying, qualifying criteria or as benchmark for success of policies. Next, please. <clears throat> From our Portuguese member, DECO, um, EPCs are too technical and too complicated to be easily understood by households. EPCs can also be inaccurate. Uh, the example given is the one of a tenant in a, in a multi-unit building who was suggested to install exterior insulation to the flat. So it's not really um, uh, well uh, logical when windows were single glazed and did not lead to any recommendation, like no recommendation was given on windows. So EPCs do not properly factor in each household's situation, be it like households living in houses or multi-units uh, and their uh, status of occupancy, tenants, landlords, or owner occupiers. Next, please. A good example, though, from Portugal uh, is the layout of the EPC because it's, it has a clear design and it uses symbols, logos, and pictograms. So those are uh, elements and components that can be easily and uh, quickly understood by people. So you see, um, it's uh, in Portuguese, but you see it's related to uh, heating, cooling and um, the, the hot water uh, provision. Next, please. 
from our Austrian member. Uh, the main topic raised from uh, Arbeiter Kammer Wien uh, was uh, related to the multi-unit buildings and district heating because there is a mismatch and it leads to um, uh, information that uh, uh, homeowners can't re and tenants can't re really rely on. Mostly when the multi-unit is uh, provided by, with energy by district heating for both space and water heating. Although the misleading information is especially true for water heating during summer months, where the influence of district heating is not accurately factored in. Factored in. EPCs only consider central heating, so it's complicated when your multi-unit only has uh, individual heating system because it's then not accurately uh, assessed and poorly the, uh, the uh, consumption and performance are poorly estimated. It's particularly important here uh, because district heating is meant to expand in the EU, so EPCs should uh, be properly factored in. And also, uh, uh, it's related to heat planning. Uh, EPCs should perhaps indicate when uh, a district heating system will be uh, expanded or even created in the coming years, so that consumers can be uh, aware. Next, please. From our French member, UFC Que Choisir. So main feedback were on the assessors, their training and professionalism that are key to explain uh, the EPCs and consistencies because uh, training and professionalism might be inconsistent. A study from 2017 on seven homes and 34 EPCs concluded that none of the homes received two consistent EPCs. Prices are as well are um, an indicator that does not uh, but is not related to an improved reliability because it goes from roughly 90 euros to 270 euros. So the, it's a, quite a broad range and it's not um, a guarantee for quality. Also here, uh, bribes were observed when EPCs are a condition to access a specific loan, for example, a zero, impo uh, zero interest loan backed from the, the state. So you see that um, a bribe is given to get uh, in the right box. Next, please. Again from France, a law voted in November 2018 will come into force in July 2021 and make the EPCs legally opposable. So the assessor's responsibility can then be engaged. For example, um, a household uh, has um, an EPC issued and then goes to the bank, which uh, um, then rely on the control of, uh, of the performance of the building via another EPC and via another assessors, and there is a conflict. Then the households re realize that they can't access the loan, then the responsibility of um, the uh, first uh, assessors is engaged. How is that translated is still to be seen as it's, as it's indicated will be enforced in July of this year. Buck is also supportive of uh, new technical measures of improved, uh, improved uh, the reliability, improved training and tighter accreditation of assessors and reinforcing controls. Next, please. So what do consumers actually expect as advice? Consumers undertake a retrofit project to improve their comfort, which is linked to healthy living conditions. Energy savings are a key component too. Regarding health, clear indication on summer comfort and dampness management and ventilation are needed. Clear point, it's a clear point of improvement of the methodology here. Next, please. What EPCs are and what they should not become. Compared to energy audits, EPCs are not as precise and accurate. To illustrate, we can draw a comparison with hiking. EPCs are the short height description in terms of the level of difficulty, length and average timing. Energy audits are the topographic map linked to a road map that provides step-by-step -step guidance on the road to follow, its intersections, elevation and landmarks. EPCs are meant to remain marketing tools, uh, relatively cheap, and should not be considered as substitutes for energy audits. Improving the reliability and content of EPCs does not and should not have to mean more technical content and significantly higher prices. And actually here, 
uh, once you have implemented an energy audit, uh, the issuance of an EPC should be um, connected and for free. Uh, you don't want to pay for both, like both uh, the planning uh, tool and the marketing one. Next, please. So key recommendations, and I will finish here from uh, our Berg Sustainable Housing Position paper. EPC should be less technical, easier to read and display more practical information for consumers and installers. EPC, EPCs should integrate information from the local market and possibly local registry to become more accurate and more consistent so that consumers can have objective comparison ground. For example, the, the average cost. Uh, a range, not uh, precise necessarily, but um, to have a, an overall holistic idea. Also, based on this information, consumers should be able to compare performances and average costs. So you have scenarios built on those information. And here it's important to factor in the, um, uh, the different financial capacities of the household. You don't want to go for a deep retrofit in every case. Uh, perhaps the, the, um, the project of the households is to have um, a less uh, ambitious uh, retrofit, but it's still uh, their project. And finally, reinforce the accountability of energy assessors in order to improve the reali reliability of PPCs. And my presentation is over. On the last uh, slide, you will find uh, the links to the different position papers uh, book uh, produced. Guillaume, thank you so much for that co comprehensive overview and scene setting presentation. Uh, I found it really fascinating um, and had to have those um, inputs from the uh, member countries is really fascinating. Um, but you do set a, a series. <laughs> you do set the scene saying that uh, for Burk, this is a marketing tool. So I wonder if our experts are going to agree with that as they make their presentations. I was uh, surprised and not happy to hear bribes are accepted in, uh, in, in France. Uh, that's not good news. And uh, maybe we can come back to this in the panel discussion, but I noted that the Central and Eastern European countries were not covered in the examples you've got. So I, I just wonder if there's knowledge about that area. And I'm happy to say there are questions being put into the chat box. So uh, indeed, to the audience, please continue to do that during the presentations. So we have a rich exchange with the panelists at, at the end. So Guillaume, thank you so much. Please stay online and um, we'll have our Q&A shortly. Thanks. So that's my real pleasure to introduce Maike Ven Venyakub from the Wuppertal Institute. Uh, Maike is going to talk to us about the Qual de EPC uh, project. And uh, Maike, I wonder if you already will react to some of what uh, Guillaume said. So you have about 10 minutes, Maike, over to you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I just I will switch off my camera again because um, my internet connection is all, not always that good. But um, yes, thank you very much. Um, yeah, um, my name is Maike Fenjakob from Wuppertal Institute and I will present uh, the, yeah, the latest issues of our quality PC project. Um, you can see here it's an abbrevi abbreviation for high quality energy performance assessment and certification in Europe accelerating deep energy renovation. Um, next please. And directly the next, yes. Um, so we are uh, a coordination and support action. Uh, we are at, uh, at the middle of our project. It runs until August 2022. And we are 11 partners from eight European countries. And next, please. Um, our objectives are to enhance EPC assessment, certification and verification uh, regarding the quality and cross-EU convergence of EPC schemes and also um, to enhance the link between EPCs and deep renovation. And in order to reach these objectives, uh, we analyze existing, or well, we already have analyzed existing EPC schemes and good practices. Uh, we develop and currently test uh, concrete pr uh, proposals. Um, then we want to adapt uh, our proposals to country needs. 
and then develop um, sustainability strategy and conclusive, uh, conclusive policy recommendations. Um, and up the, after the first analysis of existing schemes and good practices, but also shortcomings, plus intensive discussions on national level, we came up with our so-called green paper, which you can see on the next slide. Um, so, uh, end of last year, we have published our green paper on good practice in EPC assessment, certification and use. And you can see, um, yeah, the download link, but it is available on our homepage. And next, please. Uh, we came up with seven development priorities, uh, like improving the recommendations for renovations, uh, an online tool, creating deep renovation network platforms, um, mandatory EPC assessor training, uh, a high user friendliness of the EPC, um, advertising guidelines for EPCs, and also uh, one priority is to improve the compliance with mandatory use of EPCs in real estate advertisements. Uh, next, please. Um, and today in this meeting, I want to uh, show you a bit more on the online tool for comparing EPC recommendations to deep energy renovation recommendations, um, how we want to create deep renovation network platforms, and um, how we want to enhance the EPC form to become more uh, user friendliness. And next, please. Um, so the first priority I want to show you a bit um, is the online tool for deep energy renovation recommendations. Um, our Greek partner Cress um, already developed the Greek home energy check tool. And um, our recommendation is to use this tool um, as a master tool. And so we will develop it further. And the aim is to become uh, yeah, user friendly to have a user friendly interface for the building owners, uh, which allows um, further opinion on recommendations from an EPC or, or first opinion if no EPC exists. Um, we want to estimate the energy demand of a specific building. Uh, we want to include suggestions for renovation recommendations towards deep energy renovation. Uh, we want <laughs> also to compare between current and renovated state of the uh, building. And then there will be recommendations to obtain an energy audit to validate energy demand and recommendations. And next, please. Um, here's just a short overview of the input values, uh, like building type, geographical area, then uh, U values, um, the specific systems for heating, cooling, hot water, and air conditioning, and also the renewable energy sources already used. And on the next slide, you can see um, how it might look like. Um, like this, um, the results will be shown, like an estimation of the current energy efficiency of the building, um, selection of renovation options, and an estimation of energy efficiency in case of renovation. And next, please. Um, so one priority we want to uh, develop further is to uh, create a deep renovation network platform. And in our definition, a deep renovation network platform um, is a one-stop shop for building owners willing to renovate, plus a networking platform renovation for renovation supply side actors and their joint communication and marketing. Um, such a network platform can take very different forms. And um, yeah, it will help building owners to take the steps needed for renovation after um, or based on the EPC. And next slide, please. Um, here you can see uh, various possible subtypes of such a platform. Um, the basic version um, of such a network platform um, is just uh, an online information platform, uh, the one-stop shop. Um, that would be yeah the very basic version, but of course we want yeah we are aiming um, to implement more issues. And on the next slide, you can see um, yeah some services that may be included in an extended version of such a one-stop shop or a deep re um, renovation network platform. Um, it may include a network platform for learning, exchange, and cooperation. Um, it can include capacity building and training, then a step-by-step guidance for renovation project from start to end, 
um, a monitoring of the implementation of the renovation project, um, operating a physical network hub and information center, carrying out renovation projects, initiation and coordinating deep renovation demonstration projects, and or aggregation of building renovation projects. Um, in some countries, some of these um, services are already implemented and yeah, um, in the coming year, uh, we will see how much we can implement of such a network platform in rich countries. And the next slide, please. Um, yes, uh, this um, high user friendliness of the EPC um, is one thing that Guillaume has already addressed. Um, the EPCs um, are very different in all countries. Um, the quality is very different. The prices are very different. And um, what they mostly have in common, um, that the consumers, not, all, not only the households, but also the companies and investors are not happy with it. Um, so we want um, to develop uh, one EPC form that is of better quality and um, is yeah, more user friendly. Um, and next step, please. Um, in general, our project identified the need to improve the information on renovation recommendations and also the potential energy savings, but also the degree of ambition of the recommendations that are um, set in the EPC. And our enhanced EPC templates um, hold information on the energy savings from implementing a combination of renovation recommendations and the new energy performance and EPC labor class that would be achieved. On, um, in the next two slides, you can see um, yeah, the EPC template we have developed. Um, there's also a tick box proposed to state if the, the main option that would be uh, the main recommendation, um, renovation recommendation, um, if it will reach NZAP levels for renovation. Um, the discussion in our national workshops has uh, suggested that CO2 emissions saved and if possible also uh, the total economic results from the main option should be included. And in addition, the proposed template holds a traffic light system, uh, which you can see here, um, rating sim a system similar to the one recently implemented in the Czech Republic and which is also planned in Hungary. <clears throat> um, yes, currently we are testing this EPC template in more than 80 pilot buildings and um, so far uh, the feedback is quite positive. And um, to go a step further, in the following weeks we will release an update of our green paper, which will be called white paper. And um, in this white paper, uh, the recommendations from a second round of national workshops and also um, the results from our European workshops uh, will be included there. And then our next task will be uh, yeah, the implementation of as many of our recommendations possible on the national level and also to organize a dialogue on further convergence on national and also on, on EU level. Yes, and this was my presentation of the Quality PC project. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Maike. Uh, a lot of food for thought there and a lot of uh, groundwork covered in terms of where uh, the development of EPCs might go. So I will be looking forward very much to the reactions of the other panelists in a few minutes. Uh, and uh, I'm very happy to say questions are flooding in on the chat. So please, audience, continue to ask your questions. Uh, it will make for a more interesting exchange. But just before that, our last presentation for this first uh, panel, I'm uh, absolutely delighted to introduce uh, Marta Maria Sassana from the Politecnico di Milano, who's now going to speak to us about a project, um, again, H2020, called EPC Recast. And we've asked uh, Marta to talk about the link with building renovation passports and digital logbooks. Marta, the floor is yours for about 10 minutes. Uh, thank you, Adrian, and thank you for the invitation. As um, anticipated by Adrian, I'm here on behalf of the APC Recast Consortium, and we try to 
uh, reply according to our experience uh, of the project and our previous experience on how to link APC and BRPs and digital law books. Uh, the next, please. Uh, yes, I will present briefly the, the project that is just started at the end of the last year and uh, to, to see how to reply to the, the link that is instrument about the data of a building should be uh, connected and uh, which are the lesson learned from the existing initiative or previous project. Next one. Uh, APC Recast is a H2020 project that started uh, in September last year and is focused on residential buildings and more especially on existing one. It will set a well-structured process and a digital toolbox supporting a development, implementation and validation of a new generation of energy performance assessment and certification. For this, we are addressing three targets to improve the quality and the reliability of APCs. APC assessor to facilitate and improve working practices building owners to tailor renovation recommendation and highlight benefits of deep renovation according to a user-centric design. Uh, K-performance indicator should be uh, identified in order to uh, have a, a more direct link with all the target group people uh, regarding the APC and also public authorities to allow verification and reliability of APCs. Uh, the next, please. Eleven are the partners that compose the consortium uh, that belongs to uh, seven countries and are different between university and research center, SM, um, uh, SME, that bring uh, added value to the consortium with their own innovative technologies. Next, please. Here are the main action and outputs that we are going to uh, reach with uh, and uh, obtain with the project. First of all, a, a sort of automation of the data collection and the enrichment for the APC ass assessment throughout on-site scans technologies and the use of public database, uh, referring to some of the existing one, I'm thinking about uh, building stock observator, uh, observatory, sorry for once, uh, and try to implement them in order to not reinvent the wheel, but to just use and improve existing uh, initiative. Uh, then secondly, a quality procedure and the consistency checks linked with standards, like I'm thinking to ISO and SAN standard referring to M408 mandate, of uh, using a self-checking of uh, input data, referring to expert rules, values, and uh, with uh, crossing tests. And of course, to refer to this check and quality, uh, we should um, uh, control uh, and use uh, real data through our um, measure energy consumption with metering that permit uh, a calibration of the model and the verification and validation of the, the results. Uh, next, please. And of course, uh, linking to the core of the topic that uh, Adrian is asking us to reply how to link a PC and BRP, all these documents are referring to data. So, and we need for doing, to having a, a standardized process to have a common language. And of course, uh, an inter interoperability between those tools. And to do so, we are um, pushing a lot on working on a user-centric approach that permit to co-design uh, not only the certificate as it is, but along the chain of the process of the assessment of the certification, uh, getting um, a, a common language referring to KPI, understandable and user-friendly, not only for the assessor, but also for the owners. And the process will be tested according pilot project over 150 dwellings in six countries. 
by trained ABC assessor by the methodology of the project. Next, please. Here is uh, an overview of the current draft of the idea of the APC recast process by steps. As you can see at the beginning, the idea, as I said before, to uh, reach the automation of the data collection using uh, technology already available in the market and uh, put on the table by uh, the partners of the consortium to um, make a speditive uh, data collection and inspection to uh, have a direct uh, uh, creation of 3D model of the building or the dwelling and then assess the energy performance within the second step again with a common methodology and finally to deliver the APC recast certificate with a more user-friendly renovation roadmap. Uh, all these steps and the related instrument will become a toolbox within the APC recast project that would like to ensure transparency and comparability, uh, ensure um, uh, a calibration of the results compared with real measure from monitoring campaign. And again, to try to fill in uh, the renovation roadmap with a recommendation friendly for the user throughout a user-centric approach. Next, please. And here we are. Uh, what to do when we started uh, the state of the art on APC recast? So first of all, we refer a lot to the very important study on the development of a European Euro Union framework for digital building logbooks. And uh, here you can see um, a slide uh, that I took from the Bill Log stakeholder event uh, last year in November when they presented the results. And uh, why we do this? Because here is remark some many important things. First of all, it's clear now as a common definition about what is a digital building logbook. It's a common repository that should facilitate transparency, trust, and inform decision making and information sharing among building owners, occupants, and all the other public authority or financial institution. And to do so, we need a dynamic tool. A dynamic tool that uh, has a variety of data information and documents that to be, should be recording, assessed, and enriched. A sort of record of uh, a building life cycle that like uh, such as uh, change ownership, tenor, or um, sorry, refurbishment intervention. But to do so, it's really, really important to manage the data exchange and the data aggregation since the beginning of the input collection. And going to the end of the project, also the real use of these data uh, when they become uh, output. The next, please. And that's why in, um, uh, in APC, we are trying to um, build the, the, the toolbox that I just presented to you before in a sort of manner that comes to a standardized approach for all the relevant building related data to ensure a transparency of what is being collected throughout a wider uptake uh, approach that permit to uh, not only collect but gather, process and exchange the data. In compliance with the, the international standards and in comparison with building assets at European level. Uh, all of those things, of course, as are, are already well known, but the problem is to put everything together in a systemic way. Uh, and uh, the added value that we are trying to put in our project is to use these. Uh, user-centric approach. The next, please. So if we think about the, the data uh, flow that we have seen in the previous scheme uh, of the B-Log uh, tender, 
uh, here we try to uh, translate into our uh, architecture of the APC Recast toolbox that would work on the since the beginning on the uh, very clear structure of the input layer throughout the evaluation of them for the uh, APC Recast assessment uh, to arrive at the final part of the output will uh, become the recommendation layer for both the, the not only the APC but also the renovation roadmap and all of those data will be part of a common data environment on which we are working um, together. Uh, the next please. Okay, Marta, about two minutes more, okay? Yeah, 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 sorry. Uh, yeah, I will don't enter in detail. We are facing with uh, many difficulties about ontology and the PC, rec and the PC um, things about interoperability because semantic data model could be the core not only of the APC but even on digital building log elements. The next. Sorry, I will run more. And many of the lessons learned come from previous project. Uh, Aldrem uh, was one, just finished last year. Uh, many of the partners from this project belongs even to the APC Recast. This project developed a, a BRP for non-residential buildings. So starting from this outcome and uh, slightly adapting to the residential one, we are trying to uh, connect the, these two tools. Next. And to, to arrive in APC Recast to develop a sort of renovation roadmap backwards from NZ level. Because the important things that we are working is to avoid the lock in effect defining KPIs that should be easily appropriated by owners. Uh, next. And of course, to wrap up, we really, really uh, would like to underline that the important things to do so and develop all these tools and the uh, approach that we I presented very uh, rush uh, is the, to have a standardized control uh, report and certification and the consistency test of the PC assessment and to make the recommendation more understandable and effective, supported by not only uh, qualitative but quantitative uh, KPIs uh, useful for both uh, assessor and owners. Uh, sorry if I make my speech too long. Here are all the links and the references uh, to keep in touch with us. And thank you again for the invitation. It's our pleasure, Marta, and thank you so much for, uh, again, a comprehensive uh, presentation of what, uh, on the face of it, looks like a complex topic, but is actually aimed to make a simplified end result that's user-friendly, as you said. So um, I now invite the panelists to, if you wish, put back on your cameras. Uh, the audience can then see us above the, the slide, because I have a, a number of very interesting questions in the chat box to put to you uh, in this first Q&A, which will, will, will take, I hope, about 10 minutes. Um, Guillaume, the first question um, was to you, and it said, if I understand well, it's from Nicola Hagemans. Um, Burke wants to have EPC with higher quality, but not higher price. Is that not contradictory? What do you think about that? So le let me clarify here, uh, when I was uh, stating the, the range of price, uh, from uh, round to three and uh, from 90 to 270 I was not stating that uh, the cheapest option should be kept just that consumers should start getting the, the service they are paying for uh, because it's for up to now inconsistent so perhaps prices would go uh, higher than the, the cheapest option because you can't have reliable information if it's too cheap but then what I wanted to state is that uh, prices should not go too, too high either 
because you don't want to uh, have a multiplication of uh, of tools uh, mm -hmm. assessing the, the energy performance because you're gonna pay for your EPC and then for the energy audit and then for something else. Uh, consistency here is important and I just want to say that um, I won't give any uh, price for an EPC because I would not be able to do so. But uh, for uh, a lot of uh, situation, uh, having uh, assessors uh, implementing correctly uh, what they were trained for uh, would be a good start and a good money for uh, value for money for, for consumers. Okay, Guillaume, thank you for addressing the question. And then I want to move on. There's a very interesting question that has been uh, posed again by Nicholas uh, to both Maike and Marta. Um, which is, did you have a chance to present the project results to EU member states, for instance, through the EPD concerted action? And I'd like to supplement that, um, and that's to both Maike and Marta, by saying um, the, both projects seem to wish to have a more harmonized approach, certainly in the EPC recast, to have a methodology that's united across the EU member states. But we're aware that that was a proposal for a voluntary system in the existing directive that when uh, put to the member states failed to receive acceptance. So I would supplement the question uh, asking you to comment on that aspect and uh, also to ask whether or not there are some member state authorities already uh, on board with these projects. So Maike, maybe that range of questions you might take first and I'll come to Martha afterwards. Okay, thank you very much. Um, yes, uh, we have presented our projects, um, especially to the Euro uh, European Commission. Uh, we had a, a joint webinar with all our, our sister projects. Um, and um, yes, we have uh, also um, had discussions in our uh, nine pro um, project partner countries. Um, with uh, stakeholders and um, partly also with uh, representatives from the governments, um, so they should know about our project. Um, yes, uh, we want to uh, have a bit more of convergence of the EPCs because they are so different. Um, at the beginning of uh, our project, when we did the analysis, I was really surprised how different <laughs> Uh, the mm -hmm. EPCs are. You can see it in with the prices. Um, there's such a, a big price range from yeah nearly 20 euros, uh, where you just click on um, an internet platform uh, and get your EPC. Then there are very um, expensive EPCs where an en energy auditor comes to your house and makes a visit on uh, on-site visit, and then it's much much ex more expensive. But um, then there is more more content into it, um, so uh, a bit more convergence between the EU countries may, might be great. And um, yes, maybe um, we need um, some some other steps for the countries for the member states um, besides a voluntary agreement. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, at the moment, um, there's um, yeah a big momentum for this maybe uh, due to the European uh, renovation wave. Um, so there's great interest into our projects, and yeah, let's see what we will achieve. Thank you, Maike. Maybe Marta, you'd like to add or comment on this question about yeah, the state? Yeah, I I definitely agree with uh, just uh, Maike said, and I confirm also that we are contributing on the workshop of the PBD recast uh, uh, that is. Uh, facing with and uh, yes all of the sister project as Mike says are working closely together to uh, share uh, results and um, challenges and uh, we are dealing in this in those uh, weeks uh, on the definition of the methodologies that's why uh, I didn't enter in detail because mm -hmm. we're discussing this uh, because uh, from one end it could be very challenging to have a, a common methodology, uh, but as you said, there is not yet consensus between the member states to have this because it's very, very two uh, different. And uh, at the moment, we are trying to identify, as I said, only just like I would say uh, KPIs at the end of the methodology because 
the methods uh, couldn't be completely uh, aligned, being so different, and could be it could become a very huge work, and that's not our goal at the moment. But for for sure, we need to align the uh, comparability of the final results. That's uh, the uh, address. Uh, the direction that we are taking uh, on a PC request. Thank you very much, Martha, for that uh, additional set of comments. I'm going to come back to Guillaume for a question that I myself raised earlier, which is the um, consumer organizations that have given input for your presentation were, uh, let's say, EU 15 countries. Um, do you have inputs as well from Central and Eastern European countries where this tool is a newer entrant in the market? Uh, any insights from that part of Europe, Guillaume, on the usefulness of EPCs? Uh, well, to be to be honest, um, our members from uh, Central and Eastern Europe on this typical question of EPCs uh, were not very vocal, so I can't mm. provide uh, I can't provide much here, sorry. Okay, well, Guillaume, you might have seen in the chat that there's been a couple of more questions elaborating on the cost of EPCs, and maybe uh, you might uh, take that one from, uh, there's a, a longer question from Alexander Delianis. But what I like here is he seems to make the connection between the cost and whether or not there's a physical visit to the building. And, uh, uh, poses the question, shouldn't the minimum uh, price be set, uh, such as for notaries or legal services for real estate sales? Um, I don't know if the consumers have a view on that. Could you re react? I uh, I can't say we, um, uh, as consumers, would um, uh, advocate for a minimum price. But in any case, uh, that should be related to a minimum uh, uh, quality of service mm. uh, like minimum training and uh, accreditation for assistors so and perhaps also the definition and explanation of uh, what um, the, the service is based on so that consumers can tell uh, the service and uh, report they were provided with is uh, accurate and reliable because uh, from the example I gave in France, uh, the 270 euros that is no more reliable than the 91. Mm -hmm. That's also because um, the consumers were not fully aware of how uh, an assessor should proceed to, to make an EPC. That would be my guess. Um, so if you have a range of price and a range of explanation, uh, ex an explanation of uh, how uh, an assessor sh should proceed for an EPC, then that makes sense, mm -hmm. I okay. guess. So I have a last question for this session that I'd like to put to both Maike and Marta. Um, as we heard from Guillaume in his presentation, Burke see the EPC as a marketing tool. And indeed, the original idea of the certificate in the past was as a marketing tool. But both, both projects appear to take a very technical approach. I suppose that's essential to have a robust methodology behind the, the, the end product. But do you agree that it's a marketing tool and not, a, not, not really a technical assessment? Uh, and if you disagree, could you maybe say why? So let's do reverse order. Marta first and then Maike. So, Marta, what do you think about that postulation? Uh, uh, very, very compelling question to say, because I think that, uh, as usual, the, the right stand in the middle and maybe to put something uh, both technical and uptake for the market should be the right reply. And uh, even because if you tend to one of the other opposite, there will be always somebody that doesn't understand the tool. And so this means doesn't work. And that's why even uh, in our case, for example, we are pushing a lot on the user-centric approach. Mm -hmm. And so putting the, the view on, on this way, it should lead us, we hope, to reach uh, a solution that could be both uh, both elements, as I said. Uh, we will see. Uh, we are in the middle of the wave and uh, we will try to 
stay up and, and reach the goal, Adrian. Okay, Marta. And Maike, would you like to react? Um, yes, thank you. I um, I agree with you. Um, I guess the complexity is because um, that uh, there are so many stakeholders using the EPC. Um, for households, we want the EPC to be um, a, a hint, a step uh, for for get um, the renovation for deep renovation. Um, then there are there are banks, financial institutes um, that use the EPC. Uh, yeah, for for financing renovations, um, then there could be so many um, yeah yeah other possibilities to use the EPC, and that makes it very different and complex. Mm -hmm. I would say. Okay, a very nice segue to uh, end our question and answer session for this panel. Um, just for the audience, uh, please keep asking questions in the chat box and. Our panel, our, our speakers from the first session will join the Q&A session uh, at the end, so further questions can be posed to them if needed. So thank you all three of you for uh, very stimulating presentations. And now we'll move on to our second panel. It's my great pleasure then to introduce uh, Marion Jamet from the Irish Green Building Council. And uh, here we're going a little beyond energy performance certificates to talk about other information tools. And in, in particular, Marion is now going to present to us on building renovation passports. Marion, the floor is yours for, uh, as the others, about 10 minutes. Uh, thank you, Adrian, and good morning, um, everyone. Uh, I'm delighted to be here to, uh, today uh, with you. I just would like to give you a short presentation um, on building renovation uh, passports. Um, and the needed element um, if we are to create a, a, Euro, a European framework. Uh, if you want to move to the next uh, slide, uh, Adrian. Um, well, first, I suppose we could have a look uh, at the definition. And just looking at the list, I assume most of you are, are very familiar with the building renovation passport. But um, yeah, you have the definition um, included in the 2018 uh, EPPD. Uh, but really, in a nutshell, um, it's a roadmap for um, our mourners. Uh, it really like um, gives them, I suppose, an overview of the step steps to take um, to have a super energy efficient arms, um, a comfortable arm. And um, the key thing there, I suppose, is to support um, decision making uh, and also to support uh, phased uh, energy renovation. Next slide, please. Um, and um, yeah, and what I would like to do uh, today as part of my presentation is um, first to give you um, an overview uh, of a pilot that we did uh, in Ireland uh, last year and then really um, to use that pilot um, to share a key recommendation um, and try to key recommendation and learnings and try to do it in more kind of a European context. What does it mean in a European context and what does it mean in relation to the EPPD? Next, please. Um, so just really to give you, I suppose, a bit of background and why did we decide uh, to pilot um, building renovation passport here. Um, in 2017, um, we did work with the Ministry of Climate Action um, to develop recommendations for a better national renovation strategy. So the previous version of the long-term renovation strategy. Uh, we had about 200 um, stakeholders involved and one of the recommendations was um, to develop uh, a building renovation passport. Um, the idea there was that most of the renovation um, taking place at the time, and to be honest, it's still the case today, um, are shallow um, retrofits. So really the idea was to have the passport to ensure that these shallow retrofits eventually lead um, to deep retrofit and uh, to support uh, our mourners in that journey. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and so last year, um, in um, 2020, we started working um, on that pilot. So what we did first is really to try to um, identify um, the needs uh, in Ireland and also uh, to review um, the existing um, schemes and uh, pilot. We wanted uh, to pilot both, by the way, the logbook um, and the passport, although I'm going to focus only on the passport today. Um, and we did um, identify um, 
IB Road, uh, so um, it's an horizon, it was an Horizon 2020 um, program, um, as a type of passport um, that did uh, suit uh, our needs. So uh, we decided uh, to work with them uh, and to uh, uh, pilot the passport in Ireland. Um, because it was a pilot, we wanted to ensure it was tested on a I suppose on a diversity of dwellings, making sure it was representative uh, of the existing stock. So we um, piloted it on uh, 20 single uh, family um, um, dwellings. Um, next, please. And um, we recruited um, we recruited uh, ten uh, auditors again because it was a pilot. We wanted to ensure some diversity um, in the auditors. So we had architects, we had engineers, we had uh, EPC um, assessors. Um, they had a one-day um, training, um, and then following that training, we asked each of them to develop. Uh, two passports, um, and we did uh, collect uh, feedback from both um, the assessors and the homeowners through questionnaires, but also through one-to-one -one discussion and a kind of a, a group discussion at the end. Next, please. And so really what I would like to focus on today is um, the, key, the key learning um, mm -hmm. that we got from, from that pilot. Um, the first thing is really it was perceived by both group, uh, homeowners and um, assessor, um, as a tool to drive um, energy renovation. Um, most, um, the vast majority of homeowners say that they had learned something or a lot through the process, um, that it had um, given them a clearer idea of the steps uh, that they needed um, to take uh, to retrofit uh, their home. Um, so that was really, and also, sorry, from the um, auditor point of view, uh, they felt that it was helpful in terms of raising awareness um, among homeowners of uh, energy efficiency um, and so on. Next. Um, and yes, so um, uh, I suppose what we got as part of the feedback is that yes, it could support uh, energy renovation directly. So as a tool to support decision maker, uh, decision making um, uh, from for our homeowners, but also indirectly, and that's really a part of the feedback that we got from the auditors. And um, by that, um, I mean um, a key thing um, from their point of view um, is that um, it, it would be very helpful uh, for them uh, to have access. Um, um, to have that document um, because um, that's something, especially if it was like digital and if it could be shared um, with other building professionals, with construction workers um, working uh, on a building, it would, it would save time uh, and money, but also from a, a policy point of view, and that's obviously linked as well to the logbook, um, but um, with the idea that it would be very helpful um, to have this data to better understand the building stock and what is needed uh, really um, to um, reach or or target um, uh, in, in terms of carbon reduction. Um, and from that point of view, there was like a clear connection as, we, as well with uh, minimum energy performance standards, especially if they were to be introduced gradually, uh, the passport could really um, be helpful in terms of avoiding um, Locked in. Um, next, please. Um, and yeah, like if we relate the passport, sorry, to the um, EPC, um, generally speaking, the feedback was there was that um, building renovation uh, passport should really um, complement um, the existing EPC, and, and it should be. Um, it should really build uh, upon the, the success of um, EPC in Ireland. We have um, pretty, com I mean, relatively comprehensive uh, database um, of uh, residential um, EPC, um, and really the feedback was that um, if this, if that database could be, if there could be a clear connection between that database um, and building renovation passport. Um, 
it could like for instance significantly uh, reduce the cost as opposed to have to look for um, similar information um, so that's one thing um, this, um, the other thing that was raised is that obviously um, you do have similarities between um, building renovation passport and the EPC uh, advisory report um, like for instance you would obviously have information on how to improve the energy efficiency estimation of the cost but the big difference um, between the passport and the EPC and uh, advisory report as it is at the moment is that the passport is very much based on a um, based um, possible principle um, by that I mean it's based on a um, detail site visit so it's kind of taking a more holistic approach to the building but also to the homeowner um, current situation financial um, ability um, what they plan to do uh, in, in the next few years um, and so on um, obviously like question that was raised one of them was the question of cost um, um, with auditors saying that they probably would need to charge around 700 euro well our momners say they would be ready to pay but that should be a small fee so we did discuss how that could be addressed um, recommendation uh, included um, um, so really better looking, having a clear link with the existing EPC system and the software to develop EPC because that could really save part of the cost. Uh, we're also looking at aggregation, like if they could be developed um, together for, let's say, for a specific um, um, housing estate. Um, and um, we were also looking at linking them with um, existing uh, support for renovation, um, like making it a requirement to access higher level of, of grants or better tax incentives um, and so on. Uh, next please. Um, I, I'm just conscious of time so I suppose I just would like as well like to um, uh, to close like highlighting like some of the key points that were um, raised for from um, both the home uh, and, and the auditors. Uh, I think from the um, you can see it there from the homeowner point of view, like generally speaking, they felt it would be very helpful to have it um, integrated or linked to the existing um, um, EPC uh, advisory report. And we have, um, by the way, the project pilot in Ireland was funded by uh, the Sustainable Energy Authority of Ireland. And we have been in touch with them because they are updating the um, advisory report at the moment. Uh, from an auditor um, point, uh, point of view, um, I think they really highlighted the need like to connect it with the existing um, EPC um, system just to make I suppose work easier for um, construction workers, building professionals, for grants. Uh, so like one of the codes that you have on the screen is that they really see it as logical that there is a link with the um, existing software uh, to develop uh, EPC. Um, and um, uh, if you just want to my le next um, to my next slide, Adrian, um, just really uh, suppose in terms of a closing remark from our point of view, based on the uh, on the pilot, we kind of see it really as a tool to um, uh, to support um, phased uh, deep retrofits, so them to support the way the wave that way, also a link possibly with minimum energy performance standards, and in terms of next steps of what we are doing here um, in. Um, in Ireland, uh, as I said, we have been talking with our Sustainable Energy Authority of Ireland in terms of the link between the finding and the advisory report. And we uh, we are also hoping um, possibly to, to pilot it further as part of a, a one-stop shop uh, project uh, we are working on. And um, if you can share the slide afterward, you have a link to the report in that last slide. Thank you. And thank you, Marion, and indeed for the audience, we will be sharing the slides afterwards and indeed the recording of the session will be available on our uh, website. Um, so conscious as well of time, um, I now am very pleased to introduce our final speaker in this panel, Sophie durlens Quaranta, who is the French partner for the R2M solution. And Sophie will uh, talk to us for about 10 minutes on uh, digital building logbooks. And then we'll have our final Q&A session that will bring us through to um, uh, 11.30. So please keep asking questions in the chat box. Sophie, the floor is yours. Yes, many thanks. Uh, so indeed, I'm going to present 
uh, you can go to the next slide. I'm going to present the needed element for uh, a new framework for digital building logbooks. And this uh, comes from uh, a study uh, that you can see on the, on the next slide, um, from a, a study that we conducted for, for the European Commission. It was uh, last year in 2020, and with four partners, VITO and BPIE. So everything that I'm presenting today comes from this study, and you can find our publications on the website of the European Commission. So uh, regarding a digital building logbook, what we have done in this study is that we have conducted a, a state of play analysis. Uh, we have reviewed uh, existing initiatives of building logbooks, some of them digital, some of them paper-based. Uh, we have uh, carried out also a broad stakeholders consultation, and this has allowed us um, defining, well, proposing a definition of digital building logbook, conducting a gaps analysis, and finally providing some uh, recommendations for actions to be undertaken by the European Commission in order to um, promote uh, the concept of a uh, digital building logbook. So you may go to the next slide, and I'm going to uh, read this definition. Well, I'm not going to read everything, but just to explain what we think should be the definition of a digital building logbook, because at the moment there are a, a variety of uh, interpretations of uh, what it should be. And here we want to unify uh, this, uh, this definition. So uh, a, a digital building logbook, it's a common repository for all relevant building data. It's not only about energy efficiency, it's about everything concerning the building. And it must facilitate transparency, trust, informed decision making and information sharing. It should be also a dynamic tool that allows a variety of data, information, and documents to be recorded, accessed, and organized. And uh, the scope, as I said, it's not only about energy, but it's uh, a record of major events and changes over a building's life cycle. So the life cycle aspect is very important here. And uh, it uh, can include administrative document, but also information about construction material, performance data, uh, energy efficiency, but also uh, smart building potential, life cycle emissions, etc. An important aspect in uh, this definition uh, regard the, is about the, the data, how uh, data should be stored and managed. So some data have static nature, while others have uh, more dynamic nature and need to be, to be automatically updated. So this is a very important aspect that the logbook should be automatically and regularly updated. And um, there are different options regarding how the data could be stored. It could be within the logbook or hosted in a different location to which the logbook would act as a gateway. Uh, if we go to the next slide, we can see uh, the different initiatives that we have analyzed. So more than 40 initiatives were considered uh, in various countries. We have also analyzed outcomes from European projects. And in this, uh, in this list of initiatives, some have been just tested, some have been discontinued, unfortunately, and some have been uh, implemented uh, and are still in place. So if we go to the next slide, it uh, focuses on uh, the initiatives, the logbook initiatives that are in place, that have been implemented in various countries, and it shows the data fields that are included in, uh, in those logbooks. So what we can see here is that it's a very diverse, of course, some data fields are, are, are included in most logbooks. So, for instance, the building description, uh, the equipment, ownership information, also everything dealing with energy performance, 
is um, in general part of, well, it's part of uh, more than the half of the logbook initiatives, but not all. And uh, so you can see it's very, very diverse. And that's what we could uh, uh, take away from, from this, uh, this slide. And so that's why we, we, we propose some um, unification, let's say, harmonization of these contents. Coming uh, to the next slide, uh, the success factors for building logbooks. Uh, we have uh, made an analysis of existing initiatives. We have carried out some interviews and uh, we have concluded that some uh, success factors were really important. So, for instance, user friendliness. Of course, this is something we have, uh, well, previous speakers have also mentioned for the EPCs, but it's the same, also, of course, for, for the building logbooks. It's super important that users uh, understand and uh, find it easy to use. Uh, it must be uh, regularly updated. It's important also to uh, align the logbook with other initiatives and standards. And, um, and of course, to, to make the scope clear and the role of the various stakeholders of the value, ch value chain very clear regarding uh, the, the, how to, um, to input data in the logbook. If we go to the next slide, we can see, on the contrary, the barriers to implementation of building logbooks. So, of course, uh, there's a cost to implement a building logbook, so it must be uh, made clear who should bear this cost. Um, what I would like to mention from this slide in particular is the fact that some users have perceived the building logbook as another administrative burden because they did not clearly understand the added value of it. So, of course, it's uh, and, and it's also in a way related to the user friendliness. So, it's very important to make clear the benefits of having such a logbook and to make it very user friendly. Uh, of course, there are issues with. Uh, privacy and data management, and also in some cases, uh, the static, static natures, nature of building logbooks was also an issue. So from these, from the success factors, the, the state of play analysis and the barriers, we have conducted a gap analysis. Uh, and you may see here the, the main gaps that have to be addressed in order to ensure a successful rollout of digital building logbooks. So uh, you may see here, I'm not going to read everything, we have clustered these gaps into four different categories. Uh, so one about the financial aspects, user expectations, data aspects, and legal aspects. And some gaps, well, are, 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 um, uh, are part of uh, two categories. Uh, so here again, you can see what we have already mentioned, the user friendliness, the barriers to updating the logbook, uh, the benefits that might be not clear to all stakeholders, uh, issues with data governance are super, uh, super important, and challenges linked with the interoperability of the repository. And next, what we have done based on this gap analysis is that we were asked by the Commission to provide some recommendations for priority action in order, in order to facilitate the rollout of building logbooks. So priority action one is uh, to develop a standardized approach for data collection, data management, and interoperability. And uh, for this, uh, the, the question that we have to, uh, to answer is, to what extent is it necessary to formalize and align these technical specifications across Europe? And uh, here we propose to establish a semantic data model of the core logbook elements in order to, to facilitate uh, uh, its deployment. And also another important question, 
is how can the approach be ensured in European legislation. So there are different uh, options to do that. At the moment, digital building logbooks have been uh, identified by the Commission as a very important uh, element uh, to facilitate uh, renovation of buildings and it's uh, part of the renovation wave, for instance. But next, what would we do with uh, such a standard? Uh, there could be uh, uh, um, an optional uh, implementation in member states. It could be adopted at EU level. Uh, there are different options. And our, our recommendation is to have a, a technical study in order to, um, to clarify what would be the best options. Next recommendation, priority action number two, it's uh, the development of guidelines for linking existing databases. Because as we said, an option is to have uh, the digital building logbook acting as a gateway to other databases and to, 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 to centralize information related to the building uh, for, uh, for, for, for the users. And, but for this, of course, there are some interoperability issues and uh, there must be, well, we propose uh, that the Commission develop some guidelines uh, to, to make sure that it, these uh, links uh, properly work. Next action, uh, it's um, about uh, launching, per, well, further research and innovation projects in order to further explore the, the logbook concept and its implementation. And for those who are familiar with uh, the, the work program of Horizon Europe, we can see that this uh, uh, recommendation has been implemented and there are some calls for projects next year that will be about digital building logbooks. And here we have suggested to the Commission some um, aspects that should be further studied by such projects. And um, you can see, for instance, it's uh, about the improving the usability of logbooks through user experience. It's about uh, um, making clear the, the, the business opportunities that uh, the logbook creates. Uh, also important aspects about data governance uh, to be underlined. Uh, life cycle thinking, circularity, uh, etc. And the objective of such projects should be to demonstrate the benefits of digital building logbook because uh, I think that uh, experts in the field are, are, are convinced about the benefits, but that's not enough. Uh, we must also convince other stakeholders of the value chain and including the, the, the end users and the homeowners, for instance, or building owners. Uh, so it's really important to demonstrate that uh, digital building logbooks can contribute to resource efficiency, decarbonization, safety, health, cost effectiveness, efficiency, digitization, etc. So this is our, our, our last priority action. So I think this is my last slide. I hope I was not too long. Thanks. Thank you so much, Sophie, for, for that uh, presentation. And indeed, you've uh, drawn quite a lot of reaction in the chat box uh, with a number of people asking questions uh, around the uh, digital building logbook. And as I know you have a hard stop at, um, at 11.30, I'm going to just put to you Bonnie Brooks' question, which in a sense you've kind of covered. You've made your recommendations to the European Commission but um, what's, what are the next steps? Do we know what the Commission's reaction is? And to that question, I would just like to add, given the urgency of having really good tools available for a successful renovation wave, are the recommendations around further studies and uh, further R&I uh, projects not going to delay the introduction of digital building logbooks for too long? So maybe you might treat those two together. And I might invite the other panelists to turn back on their cameras if they've not done so, so we can have a, a quick uh, Q&A session. But back to you, Sophie, first. Yes, thanks for this uh, question. And actually, 
uh, the answer to this question is within the hands of the European Commission. So the results of the study were uh, really appreciated. So the, the study was uh, conducted by, well, well was, uh, let's say, um, uh, we were talking to uh, DG Grow, but also with contacts with uh, DG Energy, DG Environment, etc. So uh, all these people from the Commission appreciated the, the study, and, uh, but it is within their hands now and uh, we were already very happy to see the logbooks mentioned in the renovation wave communication but uh, we do hope now to to see further uh, technical studies towards implementation to be uh, undertaken by the commission but this is not within our hands okay thank you sophie and uh, marion there's a question for you which is that old chestnut about the payback period because your slide that showed the energy performance certificate uh, labeling from i think it was uh, c um, e to a3 uh, we have um, nicola who's made a quick calculation he, he claims that that would be a 65 year payback but that's not motivating um, and lorcan lyons uh, does respond to that saying that uh, the main motivations are not uh, payback but indeed comfort and uh, modernization and aesthetics but marion what do you find uh, on this whole question um, about uh, payback yeah thanks adrian and, and thanks for the question um just to be clear like the the average it's estimated that the average cost of a, a deep retrofit in ireland is between 30,000 and, and, and 40,000. Uh, we had a lot of discussion uh, with the auditors, with other people about including actually uh, these costs um, in the document, especially like for um, some buildings that may be more difficult to retrofit, like traditionally built building, was it going to really demotivate people? Um, another point as well we found and that think that where we probably need more um, training or a little bit more work on we felt like mm, uh, some of the auditors many of them actually were not super comfortable with the idea of having um, to estimate the cost for an action that may take place in 10 or 15 years so um, that's something as well to keep in mind but um, generally speaking and that's based um, as well on um, research done in Ireland by the Sustainable Energy Authority um, is that um, Financial savings are usually not the main motivation. So uh, mm. indeed, um, usually if you look at the motivation of people, it's more around um, uh, comfort, health and well-being. So it's probably more about talking about that uh, uh, as well as opposed to, I mean, people don't really look at payback for a kitchen or things like that. So it's more about talking about what is going to bring as well. Um, Mm -hmm. to people life and again i think that was a point that was made by uh, alexander uh, in the chat it's also about okay if, if people don't currently have the budget but they might be able to do some of it uh, at least they have a plan in terms of what could be done first that would slightly um, at a lower cost but that will still um, improve the performance um, of the home without actually preventing them to to do more in the future mm -hmm. And can I come back to Sophie, because Sophie, in your presentation, that table uh, of the 40 uh, DBLs that were examined was fascinating because I would have expected energy to have featured in all of them, but it didn't. Um, and Smart Readiness Indicator didn't feature in any of them, it seemed, from, from the table. Uh, I mean, what are the difficulties? I'm thinking about how the other projects are looking for harmonization of methodologies or formats across Europe. I mean, is this even more complex with a digital building logbook? And uh, do you think it's possible to recommend a standardized template across Europe? Yes, indeed. For instance, regarding uh, the, the smart readiness in future, it was part of NOM of the initiatives that we have reviewed, I think because the smart readiness indicator is a very uh, novel concept, let's say, but for sure uh, in the future, if we want to develop the concept of logbook further, it will have to integrate as well uh, mm -hmm. a smart readiness indicator. And um, regarding a, a standardized approach and, and a standard uh, set of data to be included in, the, in a logbook, Certainly, it should be part of. Uh, it, it was the priority action one that I presented 
about the development of a standard for data collection, data management, etc. It also includes a definition of the data fields um, that could be a part of a logbook or at least a minimum set of data fields should be recommended. Okay, great. So look, everyone, we're coming close to the end um, and I'm going to use moderators um, Prior, um, uh, privilege to just ask a last key question to each of you um, uh, and I know you've not been prepared for this so the question is given that if you were able to put one aspect into the revision of the buildings directive on EPCs stroke BRPs stroke DBLs what would it be so one key thing that you'd like to see in the revised buildings directive and as I know Sophie has a very hard stop, I'm going to start with Sophie and come back and then go through in order of the speakers. So Sophie, and then you can drop off the call. Yeah, it's difficult to answer just in one word. I would say that regarding EPCs, to me, the, 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 the main, uh, the most important aspect to improve is the reliability. Mm. And I'm also saying this as a just simple user. User, when I see the EPCs from my own all seats, um, not satisfactory and I would like to see something more reliable and improving this reliability to me is the most important uh, improvement that could be uh, done. Very clear Sophie, thank you and thank you for speaking at our seminar today. Guillaume, what would you say to my question? Uh, it's complementary to Sophie I guess, I would say accountability uh, mm. so that uh, ass assessors are uh, kept accountable of the quality of the service they give to consumers. Great, very clear. Maike? Um, <clears throat> yes, um, I will go into the same direction. I would say um, convergence. Um, we need uh, some standards converged in all of the countries to provide a certain quality for each of the EU member states. Okay, Marta? I'm afraid I can't hear you. Maybe your headphone set is mu muted. Now? Yes. Yes. Can you hear me now? Yes. Oh, sorry. Yeah, just to complete the, the, the picture and the framework, because we all said very good things, let's say quality check of mm -hmm. the data and the process to, to complete the picture of the new APC that we are expecting to have within the request. Good, okay, very clear as well. And Marion, you have the privilege of the last uh, input from the panel. Uh, thanks. Um, yeah, I think as well, I, I really would like, like um, to see um, the building renovation uh, passport included, because if we look in the renovation wave, we are talking about 23, 24, uh, 2023, 2024, I think, um, and I think really if there is a review of the EPPD uh, this year that needs to be included um, because the reality is we c most of the retrofit happening in Europe are still shallow retrofits, so I think it's important that we have that uh, support uh, for phased uh, retrofit and to really support our members. Okay, once again, thank you to all panelists for your really uh, thoughtful and detailed inputs. I think this has been a fascinating uh, set of presentations. Um, so for the audience, I'm not going to draw conclusions. I think the, the panelists spoke for themselves and were very clear on, on my question about final inputs uh, that could uh, inform the new EPPD. So I will just thank you all for your attention, for your um, uh, interaction in the chat and uh, remind you once again that this will all be made available online. Finally, I can tell you that the third um, episode of our series will take place next week. So watch out for your uh, inboxes. You'll receive an invitation, I think, within the day. Uh, so uh, thank you once again for being with us. I hope you found it as useful as I did and uh, see you next week. Thank you.